Uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Frontline Club. Uh, this session is one of a series called uh, Reflections, in which uh, leading journalists look back at seminal moments in their careers and look at their work, their <coughs> inspirations, uh, and their influences. And in doing so, we hope give us an insight into the uh, craft and practice of journalism. The way it works, I know a number of you have been before, uh, is we're going to show a series of clips that our guest chooses that have some meaning for them, and then we'll talk around them. And then I promise I will leave time at the end for questions. As I've said before, it's kind of conflation of desert island discs and this is your life. <laughs> Only much better. Um, OK, our guest this evening um, has recently moved from uh, the BBC to Channel 4 News, where he is Washington correspondent and uh, presenter. He was born in Germany and went there until, uh, stayed there until the age of 10, went to school there. Uh, and then moved to London. He started uh, in the BBC's German service at Bush House in the World Service, and his journey from there to here has taken him through some of the biggest stories of the past two decades, as we'll see. Um, he worked as a stringer in Jerusalem, covered the first intifada. Uh, he arrived in Berlin on the very day that the wall fell and then became Bonn correspondent went on to Rome, where as well as, he well, as well as covering Italy, he covered Kosovo and Bosnia, Bosnia and a lot of other stories. Uh, then in 1996, he was moved from Rome to Hong Kong, probably the first really big job of uh, Asia correspondent. His ascendancy continued a few years later when he took the uh, prize job of BBC Washington correspondent. Uh, after which he became the first presenter of BBC World News America, which is the BBC's program which uh, it's a half-hour news program which broadcasts just to the United States. Uh, and some of you may have heard his program Americana on, uh, on Radio 4. Um, from there, he was poached by Channel 4 as part of the new lineup and the relaunch of uh, the program. At the time of that move, he said, <coughs> I've got a quote here, I've been with the BBC for well over two decades. The BBC is mother, and it's been a very good mother to me. But now and again, it's a good idea to leave mother and elope with a mistress. <laughs> I can't quite work Slightly out where it is. weird, doesn't it? I just have to say... I don't I know think where your wife fits into this matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But still. She hasn't seen that yet. <laughs> hey. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> as some of you will know, at previous sessions, uh, people who have sat in this chair, uh, I can think of Jon Snow, Bill Neely, uh, Alex Crawford, have all individually selected Matt's work because they see him as the exemplar of how to do uh, television journalism. He is famous for his huge range of the huge range of languages that he speaks. His uncannily accurate impersonations, which if you're lucky you may see some later on, I don't know. But most of, of all you, things, then. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I'd like to see that actually. Uh, um, uh, but most of all for his fantastic writing and phrase, <coughs> phrase making. Uh, which is all the more annoying for his colleagues and competitors because English is not his first language. Uh, he is, of course, and please welcome Matt Fry. <laughs> How is life with the mistress, Matt? <laughs> um, well, as long as it doesn't go, you know, outside this room, it's it's it's, it's being broadcast live. But apart from that, it won't uh, go anywhere. I can let. It's it's interesting. It's it's. it's quite sexy, it's quite different to life with mother, I have to say. Um, people always ask me, well, Channel 4, I say, what's it like? What's it like here at Channel 4? And actually, in some ways, it's remarkably similar. We do the same sort of stuff. What's different is that it's a smaller organization. It's a sort of slightly neater organization than the wonderful BBC, which is a sort of archipelago of different departments and tribes and so on. Um, but it's great. It's really, I've really had a good time. It was hard leaving the BBC after all these years. It is really odd. You know, it's like running away from home, um, leaving the institution. But it's worked out pretty well so far. So you've spent, what, roughly 10 years in the States, uh, yeah. I guess? Yes, which is a really long time. That is a long time. Uh, congratulations, actually, because most people get oiked out before then. Um, but I'm interested to know, uh, especially as a presenter who's been presenting to an American audience, mm. are you doing anything differently to uh, a British audience? And I suppose, what, what, do you, what do you bring to your presenting in the UK that's good about America, and what do you not want to bring because it's bad in well, network news, as it were? The, I mean, Americans are really good at, 
at communicating, especially on television. They just know that stuff really well. And if you watch American cable TV, I don't know if any of you watch it, even the seizure-inducing Fox television, which is all whiz-bangs, and it's, they're just good at it. You know, they're good communicators. And it's funny, if you watch a lot of American television, you live there and you get used to it, it's like getting used to a particular kind of recreational drug. And then you come back and watch, you know, the news channel, or even Channel 4 News, The Mistress, and it all seems rather sort of, you know, it's tame and it's... It's bound feet as opposed to barefoot, you know. But actually, I think the secret lies somewhere in between. I think if you did the American style of broadcasting here, people would just think you were nuts. But, if, but actually, there's a way that they communicate, a, an ease of sort of humor and throwing to each other that is quite refreshing. They do that stuff really well. And there's acres of it. I mean, you know, you can, whether it's the jewelry channel or the weather channel or, I mean, the weather channel must be the best way of learning how to broadcast because you have to talk about clouds 24 hours a day <laughs> and if you can make that stuff interesting you've nailed it okay let's go right back to the beginning what did you do at the german service when you arrived i left uh, uh university in 1987 i think it was i did history and spanish at oxford and like everyone else <clears throat> i was desperate to become a banker because well, the banks all came to town and they said, you know, if you work for us, you know, we know you're creative. You come and work for us and we're going to show you the world and you're going to make a ton of money and you'll be a master of the universe. So I applied for all these banks and I failed miserably because I realized <coughs> that I was not only innumerate but also slightly dishonest. And um, <laughs> I would have been not corrupt enough to become, um, who was that bloke, Nick Leeson? So I wouldn't have made the headlines. I would have just got sacked. So luckily I never got a job in the city. So the only thing that opened to me was the family trade, my father was a journalist, to become a journalist. So I applied for tons of jobs. I remember writing a letter to the Nursing Times, you know, for their syringe column or whatever it was, you know, like, <laughs> I'm your guy. And, the, you know, the rejection slips came through one after another. And then someone said, you know what, you know, you are German after all. You know, there is this thing, the German service of the BBC, try them. And it was really weird. So my first job was to do theatre and opera reviews for basically East Germans listening on the German service of the BBC, including my relatives, who I'd never seen before. Imagine the tease, you know, there's a really great play in London. It's fantastic, but you can't come and see it because <laughs> you'll get shot at the Berlin Wall trying, you know. So it was, it was horrible in a way. Like, you know, and I remember these relatives, would, you know, they're at my mother and say, you know, we heard, we heard Matthias on the, you know, on, on the radio. You know, what's all that about? This is sort of some sort of code. What's going on here? You know, so. Anyway, I did that for a bit. But it was very sort of, it was niche broadcasting, niche within a niche within a niche. And then luckily I got a job in the English language service of the BBC doing the overnight broadcast on a program called Outlook, which is actually a very good radio program. And it's the thing that Terry Waite listened to year after year when he was in captivity in Lebanon and sort of kept him sane. I don't think my part of it, but it was just, it was a, it was a great program. And, and the, the World Service is this amazing institution that you completely underappreciated by mostly by a domestic British audience, but when you go abroad, it has a massive impact. So what was it like becoming a Bonn correspondent and going back to report on the place where you grew up? Well, I, I, I actually left Germany when I was eight. So I kind of arrived here when I was eight. So I, I don't really remember what it was like growing up in the Black Forest, right. which is where I grew up in Baden-Baden in southern Germany. Very pretty town where basically rich Germans used to go and die before they gamble themselves to death. And um, it was very beautiful. But it was really weird doing the Berlin Wall coming down because not only was this the biggest story that I'd ever covered. And I remember sitting in the, in the, in the sauna of the, the Grand Hotel Unter den Linden, which is this massive hotel, that had, a five-star hotel that had been built basically for the elites of all the communist parties around the world. And the first clients they get were the hacks the Western journos arrived, like a sort of pack of bloodhounds demanding orange juice now, phone lines yesterday. It was awful. They hated it. These ashen-faced East Germans were just distraught. And I was sitting in the sauna, and there was a very famous American journalist, a sort of veteran from the New York Times. And he was sort of swayed in this enormous um, white fluffy dressing gown. And I think he liked the East German sort of Olympic discussers who were giving him, you know, facials or whatever. And he said... Uh, I'm so sorry for you because this is the best story you'll ever cover and it's downhill from here. And he was sort of right in a way because it was this amazingly happy piece of history. But what made it so odd for me was that there I was on my Tandy. We had these Tandy computers at the time. They, I mean, they were basically like Lego um, and they didn't work very well, but that's what we wrote on. And we had an open phone line to London for two weeks 
It cost a bomb. And it was initiated by the hotel. And, and the phone line came with the Humboldt suite. Which is sort of, so basically, I was in this four poster bed. It was ridiculous, you know, this phone that was like a Cruella de Vil phone. One of those, you know, you could lift it up like this. And the open phone line, and I was writing my stories about East Germany. And then one day there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and there was a family there, all wearing matching purple shell suits. They were my family from East Germany. Wow. And I'd never seen them before. And they'd come to see me, and they were much more interested in the Humboldt suite and the hotel than in their <laughs> distant cousin from West Germany. Because they had not been allowed to go to this hotel until the wall came down. It was really weird. But the, the weird thing was, then you're writing this story, and you're engaged in it, and you know that this is the first big story, and London's interested, and whatever you write is going to get on. And suddenly the story jumps up from the tandy and kind of, you know, gets you like a sort of space alien. It's, this is personal. This is your stuff, you know. You're writing about your people here. Yeah. That was interesting. Amazing. I hope we told them off about the shell suits. Um, OK. Um, I was wearing one, too. Uh, <laughs> OK, let's look at your first piece. Yes. Um, so I, um, when, when this happened, the Berlin thing, I was doing radio. And, um, and television was, in those days, like this distant planet that you could one day hope to migrate to, but weren't really allowed to go anywhere near. Radio and television were very separate. And then suddenly, this one new word crept into the BBC lexicon, bimedial. And it was basically a way of saving money. So television people still did television, but radio people were allowed to do some television. They were allowed to, you know, s sip the nectar on occasion when the TV guy was inconvenienced or gal somewhere else. So that was me, the radio guy who was allowed to do a bit of television. And I was lucky enough to, I was based in Rome at the time, hardship posting. Um, <laughs> You know, they sent me to Rome, and I thought, Rome, fantastic, I'll do the Pizza Congress, I'll do some f Fungi Porcini stories, and they said, Bosnia, now. So I went to spend a lot of time in first Croatia, then Bosnia. And I was lucky enough to come across one Martin Bell, because he looked to me and said, OK, you clearly like this job, and, but you, you don't know anything about television, and I'm going to, if you're interested, he was not, you know, he's not a sort of, he wasn't telling me what to do, he just said, if you're interested, come and watch this stuff, and you might learn a bit. So this was a piece um, that he did from the town of Vukovar. And Vukovar was the sort of Homs of our day. Homs today, Vukovar then. Uh, and this town was, I mean, it was just extraordinary. It was basically a perfectly formed, rather pretty, Central European town that had been so badly pulverized by artillery and everything else, every other bit of hot metal, that it was literally like a sort of cartoon. It was perforated. I mean, you know, the buildings were there in their outline. <clears throat> but they were all on the verge of collapse because they were the whole city was perforated and and Martin covered this war consistently but that was the first big battle when we the world realized this is a really nasty place and it's a two hour drive from Vienna that's this <coughs> Outside Vukovar, federal troops were opening up with 38-year-old heavy guns, 155 millimeter, on Croatian positions to the west. Their story was the Croats had broken the ceasefire after only 35 minutes, and this was their reply. Inside Vukovar, too, it was clear that the 13th ceasefire was not the lucky one, but had gone the way of all the others. The fighting was the most intensive and destructive that I have seen in the four and a half months of this war. Even the outgoing fire was intimidating, and the army commander at this position gave me his version of what happened. We stopped firing at half past five last night, but just after six they opened up on us with sniper fire. Between seven and eight the firing was extremely heavy. So this morning he ordered his men to take out Croatian sniper positions, as he put it, window by window. The federal side threw in everything it had, including its aircraft, which attracted heavy ground fire. And light artillery firing point blank at the last citadel of the Croats. The army now claims to have taken the northern suburb of Borovo to have its troops in the main street and appears to be preparing for the final assault. The infantry then went in, both regular army and Serbian volunteers, to clear out the last Croatian positions. 
but it was at this point that word came through on the radio the Croats had offered to surrender. A federal soldier's gesture said it all. <coughs> but the army demanded they must give up immediately. The defenders wanted more time, and on this point of disagreement, the fighting raged through the afternoon. At some cost to the federal side, the cost to the bombarded Croats can only be guessed at. The army's advance brought out more civilians. These had been living for 90 days in a block of flats which today was on fire. They were Serbs, Croats and other nationalities. But this is a civil war and some of them were among friends. The army helped them out to their first glimpse of hope and daylight in that time. Uh, I want uh, like uh, sleep and drink 10 days and uh, I want uh, like uh, uh, my son, my mother and my father. Much more serious is the plight of the soldiers and civilians left inside. The remaining question is whether they come out dead or alive, and short of an agreement, the choice may not be theirs. Martin Bell, BBC News, Vukovar. What did you learn from Martin? Um, the, the, the main lesson of any television writing, and television writing is like no other writing, the lesson is get out of the way of the pictures or the sound. I mean, Martin, when, when he writes television, he paces up and down in a slightly nervous way, you know, sort of... And by the way, this impression thing is a bit silly, I know, but actually, there's one particular stage. The Adrian Wells, who now runs Sky News, who was uh, my producer then, we were so obsessed with Martin Bell impressions that we couldn't stop doing them. <laughs> and we literally spent... It was a disease. We spent three weeks walking around talking, would you like another cup of coffee? We just couldn't stop it. It's, it's, it's a sort of, I think it's some sort of, something happens in the brain that you, we're all Martin Bells, really. But what he, what he taught me, the way he does television, so he has, you know, he sits down, he always looks at the pictures, and this is a kind of nerdy thing to say, but if you're doing television writing, you've got to look at the pictures, because the pictures will tell you how, you know, they will guide your script, they won't tell you what points to make, but they'll tell you, they'll kind of confine what you can say. And... I think John Simpson once said that writing television is so weird, it's like writing a musical score, you're, but you're just writing the bass line, someone else, the pictures are the treble. So you, you have to complement the pictures, and Martin was the master of that. He would look at the pictures, he would then not, he would not use a computer, not even a Tandy, he wouldn't write anything down, he would literally just look at it, and then he would pace up and down, sometimes when he was nervous he'd have a cigarette, and then out would come 12 seconds of sound, of, of words, followed by a sound of, you know, shell going off, it could be a dog barking or something, but his words married perfectly with the pictures and with the sound around them. And that's why he was so good at what he did. I mean, apart from, you know, he understood the story and he was, had this amazing facility of talking to everyone. And he was a recognizable figure in his white suit. But he also taught me just the craft of television, which is a very strange craft. And it's more about what you deny yourself than what, about you, you know, what you put in. He said, never, dear boy, never ever use an adjective or an adverb. It's simply, un and, and, the, you know, and also he said, if you can't say it in one minute and 42 seconds, you can't say it, don't bother. You know. Were there any other people uh, at the time, because you were fairly young at the time, that you looked up to uh, at the BBC or anywhere else, actually? Well, the, I mean, you, loads. I mean, everyone you came across, I mean, Kate Aidy was this, again, amazing journalist, um, because she had this ability to make something like that very accessible to an audience at home. And one of the big problems with Bosnia, and you sort of see that with Syria now coming up again, how do you write this stuff? How do you report it to make it relevant to people at home? And that's really hard, especially when you're doing it night after night after night. And Kate had a facility with language. You know, she could... I remember one particular um, story she did where she focused on a housewife who was hoovering her carpet in her flat you know, classic sort of domestic scene. And she was hoovering, and she was, she was crying, and she had sort of reddened cheeks, and she was hoovering away, and the, the picture pans out, and you see that there's actually nothing left of her apartment. It's all been blown to smithereens. But the one bit is this carpet that's left, and she's clinging onto that carpet as a kind of the last vestige of the normal life that she's just lost. And the way that Kate wrote to that was just brilliant. And it immediately brought it home to someone who might have been ho hoovering their carpet in wherever, anywhere in the UK or wherever people were watching, where they weren't used to that kind of abnormality. OK, so you move to Rome. Yeah. Which uh, is a nice posting in one sense, but 
uh, Italy is not the most obvious story to get on air. How was it? It wasn't, and but I was very lucky because I arrived in Italy, um, you know, as the as the Cold War had collapsed, and the Cold War had basically preserved Italian politics in aspic ever since the Second World War. The Christian Democrats were always in power, and the Christ and the Communists were always kept out of power. That's why someone like Giulio Andreotti was able to be Prime Minister seven times. It was unbelievably repetitive, and then suddenly, as the Cold War ended. Italian politics began to shift, and all sorts of weird things started to happen. Um, industrialists and politicians who had been living in a kind of bubble of impunity for decades were suddenly hauled into jail. Berlusconi uh, became prime minister for the first time in 1994. Um, judges who were taking on the mafia were taking them on and then were blown up for it. I mean, there was a real revolution within Italy. And politically, it was fascinating because suddenly the kind of the tectonic plates of Italian politics had been blown apart. And all these new parties started to crop up. There was the Northern League, which basically you know, wanted to separate Italy, which had never been a very happily unified country. Berlusconi founded a party called Forza Italia, Go For It Italy. He used the language of football in politics. You know, he was a media mogul who became a prime minister, in a way a precursor to so many other people who have done similar sort of things. And there was a wealth of really great stories. So when I wasn't in Bosnia, I was covering Italian politics. And it was great. And one. There were lots of good stories, but one in particular which changed my life, and I'll tell you how they changed it later on, was in this kind of wave of corruption scandals, one Giorgio Armani was caught up. And he was basically accused of having bribed the financial police, which are the sort of enforcers of Italy's rather dodgy tax code. Um, and I got an interview with Armani to do this story, but the only way I got the interview is by saying I'm a fashion journalist for the BBC and <laughs> and I want to talk about hemlines and colours. And halfway through the interview, which is done with in my ropey Italian, he turned to me, and this is in the incredibly trendy Raphael Hotel in Piazza Navona. He said, You know, fuck all about fashion, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. And I said, Yeah, did you pay the money? And he looked at me and said, yeah, in brown paper bags, you know, and then he, I can't remember the sum. Anyway, let's watch the clip. The catwalk has been cleared for many of the top designers, including some of those who are due to appear in the dock. Giorgio Armani on the left, Gianfranco Ferre on the right. Judging from their relaxed mood, they were more concerned about cup sizes than court cases. Both have been charged with bribing the Italian tax authorities in 1990 with tens of thousands of dollars in return for a blind eye over tax fiddles. For the first time, Giorgio Armani has spoken openly about the charges. He told us that he was the victim of an extortion racket run by the tax inspectors. Mi è stato detto da dalle persone che erano incaricate di questo che si trattava di una prassi normale. Se tu vuoi ottenere di essere di nuovo libero di lavorare nel tuo ufficio e di non avere persone che possono intracciare la, diciamo, la quotidianità della tua, della, della tua azienda, bisogna risolvere in questo modo. È stata una cosa estremamente semplice, devo dire non, senza troppe preoccupazioni mentali. Questo era come, non so, andavo in un ristorante e dover pagare il conto alla fine. And once the piece, it was a news night piece and I wrote a big a magazine article for the Telegraph and um, Armani's English press woman went nuts and she rang me up and said, you are, we're going to sue you till kingdom come. And I sent her the tape, never heard from them again. <laughs> but I just also like to mention that I remember Vin was my foreign editor at the time and we had a very, very happy bureau in Rome. And I remember coming back to London, I said, we've got a great bureau. And he said, famous last words, it's all going to end in tears. But it didn't. It was a very happy bureau. Um, and there was a producer there who died sadly earlier this year called Patty Party, who was this a um, fantastic American, Californian, very beautiful. She was, I mean, you know, then she was in her 50s, long hair, and she used to go on a motorino with her boyfriend, who was the cameraman who shot this, Claudio Tondi, who still works for the BBC on a freelance basis. And we were just a really happy little bureau in Rome, and we couldn't believe our luck, because there we were in this amazing office. And it cost the BBC, I think, 700 quid a month. It was in the Palazzo Doria Panfila, one of the great sort of municipal palaces of Rome. We had a painted ceiling, for goodness sake. And underneath it was this incredible ex exhibition of, you know, the, world, the world's best private exhibition of old master paintings, Caravaggio's, Bernini's, and it was amazing. And, and of course, there was lunch every day. So 
Patty, you know, was looked after. So never, she never went to lunch, but we all did. The boys did. And it got so bad that we had to put a scales in the office. And uh, we weighed ourselves in and out every day. <laughs> but between all this, uh, we had these stories. And just briefly how this changed my life, sort of, is that at the end of this fashion show, which is a big thing in Italy, once a year it has La Notte delle Stelle, the Night of the Stars, and it's done in Piazza Navona, and literally 27 million people watch it. And Armani, despite the fact that you know, it was a slightly uncomfortable interview, had said, well, if you want to be, you know, just take part in the show. So I sat there, and then for like a minute and a half, I was interviewed by you know, the, the, the superstar interviewer of Italian fashion you know, in this particular show. And I said some really nice anodyne things about Italy. Anyway, we lived in the old Jewish ghetto of Rome. It's a fantastic sort of medieval part of the city. And although we'd been there for two or three years, they were always quite, you know, we always got the burnt croissants in the local bakery. They always got the really dodgy salad in the, uh, although we tried really hard. So I walked in the next day and they said, it's you, it's him, mama, come here, it's him. I told you it was him. And suddenly we got the best croissants, 10% discounts, the ripe, you know, the ripe oranges, the nice tomatoes. Our life just changed exponentially as a result of one appearance for a minute and a half on this amazing program. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know where to go from that, really. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about humour, Matt, because you, you, I think all the best writers have uh, what I would describe as a lightness of touch about them. Um, and yet, uh, you've got to draw the line quite carefully. And I think you, you, you use humour a lot in your work. And I noticed on one of the blogs that some of the right-wingers in the States were saying it's not, it's not humour, it's snide comedy mm. from a left-wing perspective. But how do you judge when to, when to draw, where to draw the line with, with humour? With difficulty, <laughs> actually. I mean, it's quite easy. You can, get, you can get carried away and you can overstep the line. And that's why I have, we have producers like you, Vin, who, you know, who come and say, actually, you can't. I remember you've, you've actually reined me back a few times. <laughs> the, Vin, the Vin elastic, I can still feel it. You know? and, uh, <laughs> it's important. I mean, I think it's, you know, if you sort of, you can be, it is possible to be glib and to be snide and you want to try and avoid it. But at the same time, there's just a lot of funny stuff out there. And if you don't leaven especially some of the political coverage in places like America with a bit of humor, then you're, you're missing a trick. And uh, I mean, you know, again, President Bush provided us with a treasure trove of humor because he was just quite, not, not because we're laughing at him necessarily, although we did sometimes, but he was just quite funny. He did really strange things. He did odd stuff. Like, I remember, I didn't, I didn't witness this, but a friend of mine did. He, um, during the campaign in 2000, when he was elected, after he was hauled across the finishing line after the Florida recount by the Supreme Court, he, on one of his campaign trips, he went to southern Pennsylvania to a mining town. And five miners had just died in a terrible accident. And he, you know, he, he, he kind of rerouted the plane to go to the funeral. And he sat there, and it was all very solemn. And you, you imagine these mining communities, it's, it's gritty. And, and they're all kind of Republicans in a way because they're, you know, it's poor blue collar, you know, white America, they like the Republican Party. And Bush was sitting in the front pew next to the mayor. And he suddenly played peekaboo with all the journos. Literally went like this, just like, where's that from? What's he doing? You know, or like there was an involuntary dance he once did when he was waiting for some African leader. He did weird stuff, you know. And, and if you don't, and I think he quite, I mean, I, I interviewed him once um, in his last year. And he was actually bored, I think, because everyone was interested in Barack Obama. And so he had time on his hands. And so we finally got this interview. And it was like arranging a first date with a kind of Saudi princess. It was, just took forever. And they were really <laughs> worried about it. And yeah, OK, and what are you going to ask about? And will you, will you ask about Iraq? I might do. You know, it's just. Anyway, so we sit down. And it was like a, they arranged 12 minutes. And, and they take the stuff really seriously. So you sit down. And he's like, he comes in. And his, he's pre-announced by his voice. And he's like, oh, this, you know. He's, he's a confident guy, and he's a president, for Christ's sake. Sits down, we do the interview, and three minutes before the end of the 12 minutes, they start holding up, all the miners start holding up scorecards with numbers on them. I thought, what the hell is this all about? Am I getting sort of scored here? No, you know, so was, there was a three in black, which meant three minutes, then a minute later, a two, and then it went to red minus one, minus two, minus three. So I, you know, it's intimidating. So I finally stopped the interview, assuming that the leader of the free world would just rush out of the office and go back to the Oval Office and carry on. But he was, you know, lingering and chatting. So I said, Mr. President, would it be possible to do a little, you know, walk and talk along the carpet? And we were in the, 
uh, the basement of the White House, which is the First Lady's Gallery. So he said, yeah, sure, Matt, sure. And lots of tactile, you know, always touching and hugging and all that. It's like, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> this is my personal space. <laughs> so we're walking along, and he stops, he stops in front of the picture of his mum, because it is a family business, after all, Barbara Bush. <laughs> and he stops, and he says, Matt, this is the shrine. And he bows, which I thought was a bit Oedipus, Oedipus, as long as he loves me. And because um, there's that whole side. And then, um, and then he said, and I thought, OK, you know, there's a long cup, so I've got to carry on with the old small talk. So I said, um, you know, I asked my daughter this morning what I should ask you. And she said, oh, Daddy, ask him why you're not the president, or something silly like that. And he, he responded, he said, what's her name? I said, uh, her name's Alice. And he clicked his fingers, and a kind of minder rushed out with, sort of liveried minder rushed out with an embossed card. And he said, Alice, A-L-I-C-E. I said, yeah. And he wrote her a little note. We're walking. He said, you got any more? I said, how much time do you have? I have four kids. <laughs> and one of them's called George. So he was writing away card after card after card. And we get to the Oval Office, and his mind is in there like deep sea fish. Their eyes are out like here. They say, Mr. President, you know, they, they can't, but they can't interrupt him because he's having a good time. So we get to the Oval Office, and he's talking. And then we're, we're now we're deep in conversation. We're talking an extra half an hour, and he says, Oh, Vladimir, he's giving me a really hard time this week, you know. <laughs> I said, I know, it must be really difficult. Mr. And then he finally says, and he's going this, that, and the other. And I've, I look at my watch, and it's 10 to 6 London time. I'm the top of the bloody 6 o'clock news, and I'm still chatting to the leader of the free world. And I said, Mr. President, I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> but I have a blog to write. And you have two wars to win, an economy to fix, and your bags to pack. So you have to call it a day, I'm afraid. So and he was sort of... Come back any time. Of course, he never, never invited back to the White House after that. But, um, but it was just weird. And the thing is... But did you find it hard covering him seriously? I remember Justin no. Webb saying there's a real pro problem developing in the BBC, if you're not careful, mm. that they are just slightly taking the piss out of him. No, there it's was plenty of stuff. Well, the, you know, the thing is, I think the sad thing is that people only remember the piss take, but yeah. actually there was a lot of serious stuff, a lot of really serious stuff about Bush. And, and, you know, the, every single night, you know, in the run-up to the war and then afterwards and then the elections, they, I mean, but if you didn't show the humanity of him, which, which there was, and not many people in this country will defend George W. Bush, but, but there was, you know. And it was just, I just had lunch with um, an old historian called Alistair Horne who wrote this amazing book about Algeria called The Savage War of Peace. And when I asked Bush what he was reading in our little fireside chat, he said, I'm reading The Savage War of Peace by Alistair Horne, which is an amazing book about Algeria and the Algerian War of Liberation. And my response was, well, why didn't you read it five years ago? Because that would have, you know, he said, we're reading it as an answer to what's gone wrong. So he sort of, um, he was interesting and he was quite clever. He just, not what you expect a president to be like. He was from a different world. Okay. So you went from Rome to Asia. I went from Rome to Asia. Oh, and uh, a cornucopia of stories there. I yeah, well, Asia was sort of amazing. Because, uh, I mean, when I told my wife we were leaving Rome, she's cried for three months. That was your fault, you yeah. sent me to Asia. <laughs> and, but I, and we arrived in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong in the summer, when you leave Rome in the summer and you fly to Hong Kong, it's like entering a Tupperware locker room. It's as smelly as a locker room, but it looks like Tupperware. It's just grey, and it's hot, and it's nasty. And I thought, what have I done? And we just got married in Italy, so what have I done? This is terrible. But we soon realised that actually that Asia is full of amazing stories. And again, I was lucky, um, because as I arrived in Asia, we not only had the handover, which was the ostensible reason for going, but also of Hong Kong to China. But we also had the Asian economy collapsing, left, right, and center. These economic miracles were going up in a puff of smoke. And, um, and Asia was great because one week you could be doing you know, economic crisis in Japan, and the next week you could be covering you know, Indonesia falling apart you know, with some really nasty stuff going on. Or you could be doing a story in Thailand, of which you'll see a little bit later. They were always different. And I was very lucky that I worked um, with three of the best cameramen in the world, a guy called Darren Conway, who's won every RTS award, I think, you know, or every other award, and RTS since forever. And then Joe Pua and Joan Chang, um, both Singaporean Chinese, um, who were brilliant. And uh, we, again, we were a happy little tribe traveling around Asia. And so this, these two stories are, one was um, is a piece from South Korea um, where there was a spate of suicides as a result of the economic crisis. And the other one was that different story. Um, and it was a, a piece about what they call feeding the ducks in Thailand. And I will explain that later on. Okay. The bridges of Seoul have never seemed more sinister. 
This is the Han River Bridge. It has seen more suicides than any other in the city. The police try to prevent people from scaling the metal arches for extra height and a more certain death, with grease. Etched in the grease, the determination of the desperate. The message on the pavement below simply reads, jump. Even in the past, many came to this bridge to commit suicide. But recently, that's become almost a daily occurrence. In fact, <coughs> in the last 24 hours alone, three people have come here to jump to their death. What's driven them to this is the severe economic crisis. Unlike in the West, where a recession produces feelings of anger, despair or outrage against the government, here, in this Confucian society, it has also produced a deep and personal sense of shame about having lost a job or one's family savings. What they share is the Buddhist pursuit of enlightenment through self-denial and a frugal way of life. But their reasons for entering the monkhood vary. He followed a spiritual calling, but others came here to seek escape. Until last May, 47-year-old Prayune Klang drove a motorized rickshaw. Although married, he slept with prostitutes, kept a minor wife, as Thai men call their mistresses, and he drank. Nothing could have been further from his mind than becoming a monk, until the most bizarre chain of events changed his life. <laughs> Speaking under the watchful gaze of the monastery's abbot, Prayun told me how on the night of the 15th of March, his wife had drugged him with sleeping pills and then cut off his penis. You'll now going to explain what feeding the duck is, right? Right, so, so it's one of those weird, really weird sort of insights into Thai society. It's like, a, it's, you know, you approach this place through the cat door of storytelling. Feeding the ducks is basically the, the, the desperate Thai woman's response to a philandering husband. I mean, they have been cutting off their husbands, wayward husbands' penises for years, but the surgical industry got so good at sewing them back on in a functioning way that women then went to the next stage, which was basically to dispose of them. And the first famous case of this, you remember the Bobbitt case in the US mm. as well, but this was Bobbitt Plus, was to basically, they, this farming farmer, farm's wife had cut off a foresaid member and it fed it to the ducks and it was gone forever, therefore he could never have sex again. In this particular case, this man, and there's a whole, it gets, it kind of is grotesque but funny at the same time, he, it was cut off and then she took the bother of tying it to a helium balloon and sending it off. <laughs> and we have an, after this, there's an interview with, a, with, the, with, with P, PC blogs from the uh, local police. So, we were, the balloon was proceeding in a westerly, he literally says, the bazoon balloon was proceeding in a westerly direction and we tried to shoot it down, but we failed. And so, but it was also interesting, there was a serious point to it, because the, the symbol of the phallus is so um, important inside Thai society, and not just um, for, for, you know, for, for the reasons of the flesh, but also, you know, if you, if you, if you were starting a new venture business, um, you, you know, you have a little phallus, you know, symbol that you tie to your belt or, you know, there are phallic, phallic shrines everywhere. It's just, it's just strange. And I think for a, for a country or a society that is so known, I mean, negatively for the flesh trade um, and where that, you know, we covered endless stories of, you know, child prostitution, which is already obviously the very nasty side of the story and, and it has to be told over and over again. This was a kind of way into in a unique glimpse into a very odd society and how it deals with this particular problem. Um, and again, it's not, in, in terms of storytelling, it's not what you expect when you see these beautiful pictures of monks. You think, oh, here's another story about, you know, Buddhism. But actually, it was different. And it's a long piece, and it goes, it goes into all sorts of strange places after this. I'm sure the audience didn't expect to be hearing about penises <laughs> no, drifting no. away on helium balloons, but there we are. Um, in that piece about Korea, there was a really interesting shot of the grease on the bridge, which mm. really makes you, is a yeah. very, very powerful shot. And um, you've, you've talked uh, before about the importance of finding little details which tell a story. And you, uh, you wrote for something I was doing, the story is in the detail, the telling cutaway, the abandoned teddy bear, the half-eaten ice cream that you can relate to the mm. bigger picture. 
And this is something you do, it seems to me, a lot. Well, I think you, you know, for, I mean, economic stories are the worst stories to tell for television. It's very, very difficult. And the way that you normally tell them is through just endless pictures of, you know, conveyor belts and, and, and car, you know, car factories or whatever. It's just, it's, it's really <laughs> difficult. And stories about, this is not a story about economics. It's a story about what happens to people when economics goes wrong. But even that's difficult. You're not going to get someone jumping off a, a bridge. And, you, and going to funerals is, is, doesn't do it either. So you f have to find something that works. And this was an amazing, I mean, because in that little scratch signature in the grease, you can see the agony. You can imagine what was going through his mind, whoever did that, who, you know, the jumper. Did he think, I don't want to do this, so therefore there's a frantic scratching. I've changed my mind. I'm not going to jump after all. Or was it just too slippery? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but, it, but we know why the scratch mark was there. We know the bridge was used for something, and it's a little glimpse through that detail into the desperation that makes people do something like this. And, I mean, in the same film, we had a, another sequence, um, which is very moving, of a, and there were many people like this, a bloke who goes to the office in the morning and says, I'm off to the office, darling. You know, I'll see you later. I'll be back at 6.30 on the, on the train as usual. They go to the local park. They sit there all day long, and then they come home. And I heard about this, and I thought, this is bullshit. It doesn't happen, and it does. And there are parks, there were parks full of people because of this shame thing. You know, you can't admit to the wife that you've lost your job. You can't admit it to your friends. There's no social welfare state. I mean, you, you know, you're basically, if you lost your job in Jap uh, Japan as well, is another place where if you lose your job, you're stuffed. You're more stuffed than you are in the U.S. So, and it's a real matter of shame. It, it's a bit like that in America too. I mean, Americans blame themselves more than they blame the government uh, when they lose a job. But in Japan and South Korea, it was really like that. It, is, it, are, the, are the details something that you are ask, you ask the cameraman to look for, or is it something that you see and say, can you get it? Both, you know, and so, I mean, like the cameraman I worked with in, uh, actually all the cameramen I've worked, I've been very lucky to, to work with great cameramen, and they always look, they know what I like, and they look for it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative process. You know, the producer might see something, you might see something. But, you know, you, you then work together quite well, and you just look for certain things. And it's amazing what cameramen see that you don't see. And then the cameramen hate correspondence because they say, Take, get a shot of that, get a, look at the cat crossing the road. And they're looking in the opposite direction. And, and the best ones just leave you alone. They just don't bother, you know. I remember when Brian Barron and, and, uh, Eric. and Eric Thyra, they were, Brian Barron, may he rest in peace, was you know, an, another role model, actually, a fantastic correspondent who wrote some of the best lines ever, um, including one with the enormous Imelda Marcos getting on stage at an election running, where he said, more suet pudding than souffle, you know, which has just <laughs> summed it up. And you couldn't get away with that line in the BBC these days, probably. But, but, he, um, but he worked well, very well, with this cameraman called Eric Thara, who is a, a wonderful sort of gentleman cameraman. And I said, how? And they would work together for decades. They covered the end of Saigon and everything else. And I said, how do you work together? He said, we never listen to each other. <laughs> but they knew exactly what the other wanted. And it worked a treat. And Eric was very slow about what he did as well. Oh yeah, well he started with film, and film was you know was precious. You didn't shoot everything that crawled. You just you, you sh and actually it was easier to edit because you only shot like let's say twenty minutes for a five minute film, whereas nowadays we shoot hours and hours and hours. Okay, there's one other thing I noticed in that um, Thai piece, which was your use of contrasts all the way through it. So you were talking about they were leading a similar life, but for different mm. reasons. This one is here for spiritual, the others for escape. Mm. Uh, you, you contrast a former life with the mm. current life. Is that something you do consciously, or is that just? I think you have to try and put everything into a context. You know, whether it's uh, you know what are these people doing here, or the cutaway. I mean, it's you know whenever you know if you're doing an interview with someone, you know there's a dramatic situation unfolding and someone is telling you what's going on. Apart from the words that are coming out of that person's mouth and your script lines, there's absolutely no convincing reason why you should get that this is something very dramatic unless you see other people going you know, at the same time. That's why the, the cutaways are crucial. You know, you know especially, in a, I mean, okay, not in an interview with, you know, with Giorgio Armani and me in the, in the restaurant, there are no cutaways, because no one's listening in apart from the cameraman, and you don't want to have him do the cutaway because then there won't be an interview. But, but, in, but, but in a crowd situation, um, you know, you've got to always put it into reference. Or it could even be, you know, you're talking to a number of people and something incredibly dramatic is happening in a square, but there's someone up in an office window who, who is having a row with his secretary at the time, or eating a sandwich. And you, you film that and you use it. Now, it might not mean anything at all, but it puts it into a context. And if you think of good filmmaking, that's exactly what they do. It creates drama. 
you know, why didn't that person, why didn't that, why was that person eating a sandwich while this person was being beaten up? Or they've just stopped eating their sandwich and they realize that someone's being beaten up and that's, that completely hammers home the point that you're trying to make. And that's where you, the pictures really are more important than the words. But what you have to try and do in the script is guide the viewer towards those pictures. Okay. Let's have a look at the next piece, Matt. We're in America now, I think. Okay. So this is... Um, okay. So the big thing about America is if I could... And um, there are probably a few people here who've worked in America. The thing about America is it's the best posting. Everyone wants to work there. And then you get there and it's, and it's very difficult. Even with the, the great gift that was George W. Bush. And it's quite difficult to make it work because every day is kind of rather similar. And in a sense, um, every day when you edit in America, and the time is against you, you know, it's a five-hour time difference, so the, the six o'clock news goes out at one, one o'clock, so it's always damage control. And you're basically looking at the cutting room floor to see if there are any gems that you can put in. Um, but sometimes you can do things slightly differently, and it makes an impact. So let's um, look at two pieces here. One is a piece I did, it's just a piece to camera at the White House, which we did all the time, but this one is slightly different. Um, and then the appalling frustration of being in Washington while the Iraq war was happening. And, you know, some of, the, some of my colleagues, like John Irwin from ITV, who's one of the best television writers around, fantastic. You know, he was in Baghdad and did a brilliant job. And, of course, you watch this stuff in Washington and you think, you wish you were there, but you can't because you're covering the Washington thing. Anyway, let's just have a quick look. The French may cringe, but here they love him. He's beefed up their budget, their salaries, and their morale. Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein he mentions in the same breath and in fluent Texan. The terrorists brought this war to us, and now we're taking it back to them. We're on their trail. We're smoking them out. We got them on the Love run. The guy. <laughs> we're hunting them down one by one. <coughs> all across the world. Not everyone likes the language or the message. Two out of ten Americans are opposed to war even with UN approval. Some of them marched to the president's home today, petition in hand. We did call for an appointment. We also emailed as well. I sent a letter. I'm sorry to tell you, sir, we don't uh, accept any mail. Mr. Bush returns to the White House unswayed by the anti-war lobby at home. The president is back and the pressure has been piled high on the UN. He may behave as if he doesn't care, but his people are already working furiously for a second UN resolution. Whether they do depends more on Hans Blix than it does on the man who's just got out of the helicopter. Matt Fry, BBC News, at the White House. To venture out was a calculated risk, but an irresistible one. We'd heard no gunfire, and there were enough Iraqi cars on the road to give us confidence. One of the first places we reached was an office used by Saddam Hussein's secret police. Here, his numerous portraits were going up in flames. At last, ordinary Iraqis were showing their true feelings towards their leader. When people saw our camera, they couldn't hide their delight at the turn of events. Further on, we spoke to some civilians who told me how they felt. Saddam going. Yes. Saddam going. Saddam. I am happy. I am happy. Yeah, free. Free. Feeling free. Freedom, freedom. Then, all of a sudden, the United States Marines showed up. on the streets of the Iraqi capital. Why do you like that Johnny Irvine piece? Because here is a, here's a moment of history. And, and he does exactly what you would do if you were caught up in it. He just thinks, you know, basically thinks, blimey, this is amazing. Doesn't almost have to say anything, but he just, the way he's standing in the road, you think he's going to get run over by that truck. <laughs> And, and he looks around, and it's, that's what you want. So it's immediate, it's not a kind of set piece to camera, I'm standing here, this is my 30 seconds of what I think this is all about. It just says it all. He writes beautifully, it's, it's, again, it's what you talked about earlier, it's the light touch. And that piece to camera at the White House, mm. 
You're not supposed to do that, are you? No, we got told off by the um, because no, especially the, there's the White House is run by the by the television pool, and they don't like things to be done in a different way. It's a little bit like a sort of courtly ritual, and we were doing the equivalent of sort of dancing with Her Majesty, doing the pogo. It's just not done. You don't do a piece to camera in front of the president as he gets out of his chopper. And we did three or four of these, and then they told us to not ever do them again, otherwise there'd be repercussions. Um, but actually, if you don't, and it wasn't particularly exciting. I mean, there's a man with a dog behind you. It's a bit odd, actually. It's got a slight drop the dead donkey element to it, <laughs> um, to be honest. But um, and also, I looked horribly young there. That's really that's the bad thing about these sessions, isn't it? You know, you just get. Anyway, the um, but the funny thing about Washington is that you, you know you're always looking for that unscripted moment in one of the most scripted cities in the world. Everything is you know orchestrated. Everything is basically organized so that nothing gets, you know, is, is remiss. And, um, and when you get these unscripted moments, these unwillful moments of humanity, it's gold dust. And uh, the most famous one was perhaps George Bush before he declared war on Iraq. It was used by Michael Moore in the um, Fahrenheit 9-11 documentary. The cameras are trained on the president in the Oval Office. And in the 20 seconds before, they, they switch the cameras on, but you're not supposed to broadcast. And you see him doing... You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a disembodied hairspray can behind him, like a sort of ghost, and psh, little puffs are coming out of it, and then hands appear, and they pat him down, and then he does this. He says, you know, I can do this. So you can hear him say, more or less, I can do this, Dad. I'm tougher than you. And, um, and we, I think, inadvertently, the BBC broadcast, and we got into so much trouble, because it, it, it basically shattered the illusion of the presidency for a moment. And so I, there was a similar... Uh, moment, which we, unfortunately we couldn't find. It was there was a big scandal um, during the Bush White House when Scooter Libby, who was uh, Dick Cheney's yeah. chief of staff, was basically done for. It's a long story, but basically it was all part of the WMD lie story. And the morning that he was indicted, the White House camera pool was, as usual, trained on the Oval Office, which at you know six o'clock in the morning is essentially a, a set of windows um, with some dim lighting. And it's shot on a, you know, it's terribly shot. It's just a bloke who's bored. And he just switches on the camera just in case the president gets shot. And what he got was this amazing scene of the president in one window, Cheney in another window, and Karl Rove in the third window, and Don Rumsfeld kind of circling the, whatever they have in the Oval Office, one of the, you know, the coffee table. And they're all laughing hysterically. I mean, they're laughing their heads off about something. And again, you don't know, they could be laughing about some dirty joke, or it could be about last night's baseball, you don't know. But to have these people doing something unscripted, unsolicited, and something which they think you know, is not important, or certainly is not going to be watched by anyone, and then to use it in a way that doesn't put words into their mouth, but just says, here's a funny old scene, is, is gold dust in Washington. But you've got to be very careful how you use it. Yeah. OK, let's move on to another story that you did when you were in Washington, a huge story. Yeah. Um, Katrina. It got you out of the, the beltway. I'm always getting out of the beltway. This is what everyone says. You've got to get out of the beltway. Here was the, out, the quintessential out of the beltway story. And, um, and it was Hurricane Katrina. And we had covered various hurricanes before. And hurricanes are a great thing to cover uh, if you want to understand the force of nature. But this one was particularly dramatic because it basically turned New Orleans, one of the great cities of, of, of the world's richest nation, into a complete basket case. Let's watch. Eight in the morning at the casino, gathering point for the bewildering array of forces that now call this city home. The 82nd Airborne, punctual as usual. The heavies from Chicago, the Oregon National Guard, and not to be outdone on their home turf, the local cops, a little late, but pumped for today's mission. What are you doing this morning, tell me? Uh, well, it's, it's a, uh, a raid on a location where there are snipers that have been shooting at uh, some of the technicians that are working on a, a sprint tower. And uh, we're going to try and eliminate that so we can get more communications up for the town and for the rescuers. It's because of problems like this that the mayor wants everyone out of the city. We're all off to the Fisher Estate on the other side of the Mississippi. It's a poor housing project and the SWAT teams go from door to door as they do in the rougher parts of Chicago, or Baghdad for that matter. Please, please. Loot is here, insurgents there, enemies galore. The dogs are champing at the bit. Finally, someone is searched, but nothing is found. 
What we have found all day are bodies, dead ones. One reason perhaps why we're no closer to knowing the death toll is that no one is bothering to pick them up. A wet and shallow grave for a corpse without name and dignity. Go to the right. Go to the right. Way right. Two bodies here and one more next to a long line of police cars and ambulances. Did you know that's a dead body lying there? Do I know if it is? Yeah. Yes. Why hasn't anyone cleared it away? Uh, I don't know, right now we're in a search and rescue mode and that's all our, that we're tasked with. Since we're from another state over here, we're assigned to the Louisiana Fish and Game Department, so... But that body has been there now for five days. I don't know how long it's been there. We well, just I, got I here saw this it morning. five days ago. No one yes. clears these things away? I mean, doesn't that Not person there point. deserve a dignified yes, burial they, of some sort? They sure do, but uh, right now we're tasked with trying to rescue the, the living. Yeah. Because of the bodies and everything else in the water, this is now a noxious gumbo breeding bacteria. Hence the masks. We joined the Texas Wildlife Department in their hunt for the living to persuade the stubborn few to leave this city. As you can see, this area was particularly badly hit. The water rose to the second story of most buildings. Most people here have already been evacuated, but there are some who are still reluctant to leave. Like John, a 70-year-old veteran with water, food, and nerve. If you catch me out in the storm, blow my ass away. But I can be on my porch, right here, protecting my property. That's it. Yeah, I'm all right. There is no compulsory order to remove these people. So many are staying, seemingly at home, in the grim black water that has turned their city into a living graveyard. Matt Fry, BBC News, New Orleans. That was a powerful story. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... Uh, That's a piece of storytelling, actually. Well, it was just, it was uh, the, the cameraman, Chuck, uh, who's based in New York, was fantastic. And I don't know if you noticed, um, in the driving shot, you know, there are lots of boring shots of correspondents driving. Wow, he can hold a steering wheel. It's amazing. But there was a helicopter. And, he, and, and it's a great cameraman who, who sees that helicopter and sees how it works with it. And he just, it's just a little glimpse. It's a flash frame of brilliance. Um, and, but, you know, the story just, it was extraordinary. And uh, I remember we arrived, I was actually, when the hurricane hit, I was still in Europe on holiday with my family. So I, I legged it back as quickly as possible. And um, we, we flew to Baton Rouge, which is the state capital of Louisiana, and we found a, I found a driver, who I think was called Brad or something. He was a big ex-Marine guy, no hair, neck wider than his face, shoulders a lot wider than his neck, and big guy. And we had this big car, and we drove across the Huey Long Bridge into New Orleans, which is the only way in. And suddenly, at the top of this bridge, with you know, and sort of more wind coming in and rain, he he, he starts sweating. And he stops driving. He said, "What's the matter?" He said, "Matt, I got to tell you, I got really bad vertigo, and I hate this bridge. And I've never been across it in my life." I thought, "This is great. This is starting just fine." We then drove into the city, and he's and everyone is so twitchy. There's national guards there, you know, 18-year-old kids, you know, with guns. I mean, it was it was just a disaster. And we turned around the corner on the way to the BBC office, which was then the bus stop of the number 16 night bus on Canal Street. And before we get there, we drive around the corner, and suddenly there are two SWAT teams in front of us. And look, there's no camera at the moment. It's just me with this driver meeting my team there. Otherwise, it might have been on film. Two SWAT teams converge in front of the car, and they're, you know, it's like straight out of the movies. Get down! What do you want? You know, basically, it was just hysterical. And, and, and the driver, instead of just doing what he's, you know, like this, he always do this, starts fiddling under his balls. He starts putting, puts his, I thought, this is not the time to play pocket billiards, my friend. <laughs> and he pulls out a magnum, the <laughs> biggest bloody gun you've ever seen. And he holds it up and he says, and I apologize for this, but he says, no coon's going to take my car away from me. And I thought, blimey, this is it. I've survived Bosnia. I've done East Timor. <laughs> shallow grave for me in New Orleans. And basically, and I'm, I'm convinced of this, I mean, and the, the, the SWAT teams were not happy about this gun. Had he been black, we would now be dead, or he'd be dead. Because there was so much racial tension. There was such an unbelievable trough of misunderstanding and of paranoia. The whites were convinced the blacks were there to lynch them. The blacks were convinced the whites were there to kill them. And I remember this incredibly moving scene, uh, which is in another one of Chuck's pieces, where there was this... Um, these guys from Tennessee had come in. Every, and that's true, everyone with a gun from, who could drive to New Orleans drove to New Orleans because they were convinced this was 
the war all over again. This was trying to contain the war. There were like three looters, you know. I mean, what you really needed was, you know, someone from the Danish section of UNHCR with a, with a cup of herbal tea. You know, just someone who's going to be nice to these people. So this particular scene, the guys from Tennessee, they wear red bandanas, never a good thing. They've got shotguns, and they're pointing it at this crowd of mainly African Americans who are in the convention center, which has turned into living hell. And these two guys are walking, you know, they, they send a delegation, the African Americans, of people who are trying to convince the, the guys with guns that all they need are some school buses, because they're all drivers, and they can then drive 10,000 people out of the city to safety. And this guy walks towards the pickup truck, and they're cocking their guns, and they're about to shoot him. And all he's doing is walking towards them, asking a question. And we then have to intervene and say, look, this is what this is, what this is going on here. This is quite basic stuff, you know. Let's put you guys together. Let's all sit down. And it was just awful. And, uh, and it really showed, I think in America was deeply shocked by it. And it was interesting that my American colleagues who basically, like a lot of us, swallowed the WMD story hook, line, and sinker and, and did themselves no favors, um, suddenly rediscovered their spine with this particular story. And it was partly the Bush administration being as asleep you know, at the switch. It was partly the fact that the mayor of New Orleans was nuts. The police chief was completely off, off Broadway. You know, they were, everyone was just insane. The governor of Louisiana was, was, was this sort of Cruella de Vil um, Democrat who, you know, no one worked together. It was a dysfunction of America at its very worst. Okay, I need to move us on through the last pieces. Um, you, you moved on to presenting. I did. Um, and the ultimate, uh, the death for any good correspondent. Become yeah. a presenter. <laughs> so, no, no. It was, yes, gone. Alex Crawford says she'd rather eat her own liver. Yeah, than no, I heard that. Yeah. Uh, um, so we've got a couple of clips here. Um, do you want to introduce them? Yeah. So presenting is... Um, and then we'll talk about the craft. Presenting can be a lot of fun, especially when you're doing it on the road. Yeah. And, uh, and this, this weird program that I hosted for a, uh, three years called uh, BBC World News America. Actually, it was a wonderful program. We were trying to explain America to the rest of the world and vice versa. I'm not sure which one is more difficult. But, um, and my, my American boss, Rome Hartman, who now works for NBC, who's one of the sort of greats of American television production, always liked me to, to get on a plane and go out and do some stuff. And here was a, a little story in Chile of some miners who were trapped underground and they were going to be rescued. And we thought, okay, well, let's, let's cover this. And it turned into a, an extraordinary event. It has been an extraordinary story of camaraderie, resilience, and survival here in Chile all day long. We've just heard news a few seconds ago that the 24th miner has been brought to safety and to the surface. Most of the miners are now free. They had been trapped for 69 days, 2,000 feet under the ground in a granite prison that was dark, dank, and hot. The first miner was released just after midnight to scenes of almost hysterical jubilation. The youngest and the oldest have now also been freed, but the president of Chile has made it clear this operation is not over until the last one of them has been brought back to the surface. Today, Camp Hope really did live up to its name. Here's Andrew Harding. Like a rocket on the launch pad, the Phoenix escape capsule. Good evening from an extremely busy airport here in Porto Pitts. The United Nations says that the disaster in Haiti is the worst that has happened in front then because of the difficulty of getting aid to the people. Meanwhile, there are mounting concerns tonight about growing violence and reports of armed gangs looting on the streets of the capital here in Haiti. At the same time, it is quite obvious from everything you can see around you that aid is coming in all the time. Hillary Clinton, the US Secretary of State, was here earlier today. It is all part of an effort to bring as much aid as possible, as quickly as possible, to the people in the capital who need it most. Leavened by despair, anger is now rising on the streets of Porto Prince. Barricades have sprung up across some of the main roads, a cry for the world to help. But take a closer look, not just crates and barrels, but bodies. I so nearly lost your voice. And well, no, no, no the, 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 the lesson of that particular piece, and it's a very profound one, is make sure the bloody mic works or hold it close enough to your face. It was a very, very noisy place. Um, but if I can just talk about the, the, the chili thing first, it was the, the, I don't know if you watched any of the minor stuff. It was an extraordinary story because it was a rare story of, of, you know, of hope and 
and release and liberation from this, you know, kind of underground prison that people can imagine. Um, but it was also this amazing site. I mean, the Atacama Desert is where they practiced with a Mars rover. That's where, when, you know, I'm sure that when there was a Mars landing, it actually takes place in the Atacama Desert. It's a pink desert. It's very rocky and there's nothing there. And it's very beautiful. And, then, and you, so you drive through this desert for two hours and suddenly, like some sort of medieval caravanserai or some sort of shrine, there was this amazing media village of satellite trucks and trainee priests and journalists and aid organizations. And then in the president of Chile in the, in the middle of this, who realized that as a former media mogul, this is a great opportunity here. And this was the most shot liberation ever. I mean, there, were, there, were, there was a, we call it the, the pod cam. There was a camera inside the pod that went up this hole. Every, everything was covered. But also then within that, the kind of weird village-like drama atmosphere. So there was a holding area for the wives to come and greet their husbands, but there was one for the mistresses as well. <laughs> and, and we did this, you know, so we talk about broad, you know, presenting. I mean, I think that was the 10 o'clock news or the 6 o'clock news. But I had already been doing 10 hours. And my, my colleague, Tim Wilcox, who really owned that story, had done like 15 hours. And at one stage, we were, we were going actually mad. I don't know if you've seen the film, um, They Shoot Horses, Don't They, with Jane Fonda. It's about a dancing competition where people just die at the end of it. It was similar. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember asking one of the editors in London, what would you like for the next hour? And he said, the hour, which normally no one ever says. And you kind of think, who watches this stuff? I mean, this is about, you know, this is ridiculous. And there were some really, there were some low points as well. Um, a colleague who shall remain nameless said very excitedly at three in the morning, minor number 17, the first one with a beard, you know. <laughs> but I was getting messages at, at three in the morning when the audience at three in the morning was half a million people on the news channel. That stuff doesn't happen. And I got this message, this tweet from someone said, Matt, I'm really moved by what you and Tim are doing. I've just switched from Chile and Chardonnay to Sauvignon Blanc. And I thought, that's it. You know, <laughs> it's that serious. But everyone was engaged in it. And oddly enough, if we sort of lost sight of what these people are doing now, I'd love to do a follow-up on them. You know, what are they, what, these 37 guys, they clubbed together. They decided not to be picked off by the networks to give interviews. You know, Hollywood was knocking on their door. And they said, no, nope, we're going to take this in our own time. And I kind of love to know where they are at the moment. It'd be a great documentary follow-up. Can you tell us a little bit about presenting, Matt? Because you made the transition pretty seamlessly, mm. actually. Um, what, are the, what, are the, what, what have you learned about presenting that you would tell to a newcomer here who's about to go start doing it? It's, it's actually, you know, and, and one, on one level it's easy because you're reading out aloud, and if you read out aloud to kids, then you can read out aloud in a television studio. But actually it's difficult because it's such an, it's such an artificial, mm. sort of airless, atmosphereless environment that um, you have to really think about why you're introducing this piece. What's, why should anyone at home bother watching this particular piece? And with that in mind, you have to write your introduction. And although you weren't there to report the piece yourself, you have to calibrate your enthusiasm to sell the piece. You're a salesman or woman for that piece without giving any of the lines away. And it's a tricky thing to do. And some people, I mean, John Snow does it incredibly well. Um, Hugh Edwards does it in a more magisterial way on the technical news, again, incredibly well. Um, I learned a lot from America because the American anchor men, and when I started presenting, I said, I'm, I'm a newsreader. And they said, no, 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 oh, no, no, Matt, Matt. And they, they, all the PR people called me and said, Matt, you're not a newsreader. You're an anchor man. But what can we say, presenter? No, no, you're an anchor man. It's a different, it's like sort of demigod status, which I never quite reached, unfortunately. But that's, you know, because the anchor man anchors the show, he's the, st the supreme storyteller. And in a way, it's a, it sounds a bit pompous, but there, there's, there's something to that. You know, you're selling the program. You have to provide a narrative through all these disjointed stories that somehow are supposed to work. Um, and again, you know, Americans take that stuff really seriously. So when they write their intros for stories, they really go over them, you know. What, what can we assume that the audience knows? What don't they know? How can we sell this? How can we make it tragic, funny? And how can we signpost it? And sometimes it's a bit cheesy, and sometimes it works really well. But it's, they're, they're constantly thinking about how they're selling this stuff, because they have to sell it, because if the ratings are bad, the show folds, you know. OK, let's uh, introduce. Two, can we run the last two pieces together? Why don't we? So that we can have time have for questions. No, no, no. Um, so do you want to introduce them, Matt? Yeah. So uh, one is Alex Crawford. You know, you're all familiar with Alex. She's uh, not only a delightful person and a mother of four, and I've got four kids, so, but I just don't understand how she does all this while being a mother as well. That's an amazing. Another subject for another day. But the reason why I've chosen this clip, it's the famous clip of you know, the day of the uh, liberation of Libya, is that 
you know, here's a woman who was doing hours and hours and hours of live broadcasting under very difficult circumstances all night long, and she still manages within all that to craft a really well-written piece that captures the moment. And that's extraordinary. And then Alex Thompson for Channel 4, um, is a, is a, he's a, I've always admired him, actually, for a very long time, and um, I finally get to work with him. And this is a piece done from the tsunami. And what Alex has is that supreme ability you know, to write to the pictures, observe the detail, and then actually pause when you want him to pause because you're taking it all in. Don't smother it with words. And appreciate the sheer colossal weirdness of what goes on in front of you, which is essentially kind of fishing boats tossed around like toys. There were no Gaddafis and no loyal supporters waiting inside when the compound walls were eventually breached. This was the seat of Colonel Gaddafi's power, now being systematically destroyed by his people. His image was defaced. His home emptied of its contents. His possessions taken as souvenirs. I, um, I just went inside his room, which Colonel was, was his yeah, bedroom. Yeah, Gaddafi's yeah. bedroom, and I it was uh, it was really I was like, oh my god, I'm I'm in Gaddafi's room, oh my god. But then then this thing happened. I found this. I, I was like, oh my goodness. But I'm happy now. I'm having this thing. And I'm, I'm happy for Libyans, for, for those people who have suffered a lot. And I, I really thank all, all the countries that have stood with us, that have given us uh, the, uh, the, happy, uh, uh, the help and, and support. The port of Kisinuma this afternoon. The cries of distant crows, the loudest noise that you can hear. The town's giant tuna fishing fleet stranded where the ebbing tsunami had left them all over this town. People are coming back here. They can't quite take it in. Last Friday afternoon, minutes before the tsunami, the town's tuna fleet weren't anywhere near here. They were at anchor right out in the bay. But the damage done to the tuna fishing industry and these vessels is as nothing compared to the damage in some ways that was inflicted by the boats and the tsunami right here. Suddenly there's a man running through the rubble looking for his lost father. <laughs> then we find his dad. It's his house, here. His house? Where? There's just a puddle. But it turns out this was his house. That is just so powerful. I don't know what you thought of that, but I mean, that's just, you know, and, and he, he does it beautifully. I mean, you, you know, someone who is less good would have just thrown that away because... Or written you know, all over it, in fact. Or written all over it. Yeah. I mean, the crows are crucial. The fact that he, then he refers to it. And you feel at that moment, the way it's shot, the way he writes to it, or doesn't write to it, because he's staying out of the way, that you are there. It puts you right there. You're walking through that scene with Alex Thompson, and you can't believe what's going on. And again, it's about the detail, you know, and the, sh the, sh the co you know, it's so colossal to have these, you know, trawlers stranded in, in like sort of badly parked cars, and there they all are. It strikes me it takes huge confidence to write that little, though, if you see what I mean. The, the more confident you are, the less you write. Also. Possibly. Yeah. Um, it also looked like Sasha Baron Cohen had turned up in the middle of Alex, Thompson, uh, Alex Crawford's but also, Was he holding an Oscar? What was that? You know, amazing. Uh, you know. No, that was a brilliant, that was so exuberant. I mean, that's just memorable television. You know, two funny hats meet each other, you know, on, on, the, on Liberation Day. Yeah. OK, let's have a few questions. If you could put your hand up um, and then just two things. One is, can you wait? First of all, could someone put their hand up? Um, and then can you wait for the microphone? And then one question each, if that's OK. I know what you're like. 
Hi, Matt. Uh, my name's Joel, I'm a young freelancer. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of challenges do you think that particularly the next generation of young journalists are going to face and what advice would you give to them? Um, I think the challenges in some ways are always going to be this, on one level are going to be the same. You know, find a good story, tell it in the right way, make sure that someone is actually listening and pays you while you're doing it. That's, that's the kind of basic challenge and it's, and it's not easy. But in a way what you have, the amazing, I mean if, if you're starting out now, you have an incredible array of tools at your disposal. Um, which are just so much better than the kind of tools that we dealt with and a lot cheaper as well. I mean, I remember when I started in television, my perpetual fear in that Rome Bureau was missing the satellite feed. That was 2,000 quid down the toilet. And the satellite station was an hour away from the office. And every feed was a nail biter. Now you have a computer, you know, you have a satellite phone if you're somewhere where you don't get broadband, and then you just you uplink and off you go. So, you know, and, and blogging and tweeting, I mean, there are lots of tools for telling stories that are at your disposal. There's a lot of stuff coming into, you know, into the citizen journalist or into the journalist that you can use and process. In a way, your challenge will be trying to make, make sense of this sort of ocean of stuff and picking this, the things that you like and you think are worth talking about. But in a way, the, the rules of storytelling remain the same. You know, watch carefully, listen carefully, what strikes you? What, what, may, what interests you about this story? Why? Listen to that inner voice that tells you that's why this is interesting. And then write about it. Okay, can you pass the mic forward one if that's okay? Hi. Um, sorry, I've lost my voice a bit. Um, ha you've covered such a, a wide array of stories mm. and uh, each one seems to have taken up a huge amount of your life. Like mm. with the Chilean miners, that, that took you know, 15, 10, 15 hours of your life. Mm. How do you, uh, in your work, when you're looking for stories mm. and mentally let go of, of that story? Like you said, um, you, you wanted to know what the Chilean miners might, mm. might be doing now, but, but also how do you let go of that, that period of time? I have to say it was very easy to let go of the Chilean miner story because we were living in a really dodgy tent um, in the middle of the desert and, uh, and I was quite happy to let it go. You know, it was one of those, you know, the story's over, we can all go home moments, which is fantastic. Um, I mean, stories linger in different ways. Uh, I covered the Bosnia War in and out for, I don't know, four years, not as much as some people like Martin or uh, Alan Little who did a, you know, that was sort of, you know, he defined the story and it defined him. Uh, Jeremy Bowen, they, but, and, and I know from Alan, who's a friend that he still goes back there. He was there just recently, I think, for the launch of Angelina Jolie's film. And that story has stayed with him. I have to admit, the Bosnian story, the minute it was over, I just said goodbye to it. I, I never want to go back there again. And maybe this is post-traumatic stress, or I just have no inclination to visit that place ever again. And, but, and that's, I'm not that selfish with every story. I mean, there are some places where, horrible places, where I like going back to. But the different stories affect you in different ways. And sometimes you've just had too much of it and you don't want to see it. And sometimes you feel that you haven't done enough of it and you want to revisit it. Um, but it, it's good. I mean, it's good to feel. I mean, New Orleans, I've, I've been back to New Orleans a lot since Katrina. And I feel this sort of um, affection towards the city as a result of what happened. Okay. One down here. Hello. My, no my name is Antonia. I, I don't know very much about your ca brilliant career. I apologize. But I'm here to catch up. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I wonder... When you were in uh, Rome, mm -hmm. uh, making friends, enjoying um, spaghetti alla matriciana, and certainly doing a very good job, mm. did you ever happen to write about Vatican banks, which are to me um, both a ghost mm. and uh, a taboo, a mm. ghost haunting my country and mm. a taboo? And if yes, how far did you go with that subject? Not very far, and we, it, was, it was a very big subject at the time, and I, it was a huge subject when I was at university, actually, the Banco Ambrosiano and, and all that, but we didn't, it was, there was so much other stuff going on. I mean, one should have done an investigative piece about the Vatican banks, um, and it's one of those boxes I didn't tick, and I, it's a missive, but there were so many other things going on with Tangentopoli and Berlusconi and the Lega Nord that we had our hands full, and then between all that, the, the recreation of going to Sarajevo, so I failed. I'm sorry. Mi <laughs> dispiace. Uh. Matt. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, my question is um, around um, the reporter stepping back. Yeah. Um, so many of the reports that we've seen tonight have focused on particular individuals. Um, my question to you is how important is the question that you ask a person? Because um, Alex Thompson got a wonderful response out of that person in Libya. 
Um, how important is crafting the right question to, to ask someone? Um, that's a good point, actually. It's, it's tricky sometimes. I mean, America is easy because everyone has a story to tell. And, uh, and you just have to, the microphone just has to be unpacked from its cellophane wrapper and there you get the sound bites. Um, Libya, moment of liberation. Uh, as we discovered in Libya, half the country speaks fluent English and all went to you know, university in London. Um, <laughs> but then Asia, for instance, was very difficult. Asians, I remember in Hong Kong at the time of the handover, literally having to use you know, forceps on people to try and get one little answer about um, you know, democracy or Britain out of them. They're just afraid. They don't want to talk. America does not have that problem. <laughs> and in a way, you know, it's a, I mean, you don't even want to, in America, you don't have to imagine what might be said and which is the right question to elicit the right answer. It just happens automatically. Um, whereas in other countries, you're digging. And often, if you're digging more and more, the worse the answers will be, especially on this sort of chance encounters. But you know, the art of interviewing is tricky. I mean, it's, it's tricky in a studio with a government minister. Um, and it, it can be very tricky in these sort of situations. And, but my policy is always to start off with a big fat smile and you know, just try and disarm the situation by, you know, by being unthreatening. And then you can go for it afterwards. OK. okay. Hi. Um, my name is Vanessa. And I'm a TV journalist from Holland. And one piece you did, you didn't show it tonight. Uh, is it on or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, made big impression on me was what you did at the primaries uh, this year yeah. uh, and it was with the the, hum, the, the hunting yeah. uh, and I was very impressed by the way you used uh, a totally different subject and connected that to politics in, oh, in, yeah. the, in the US and I was just wondering while, wa while watching it um, how you came up with that idea was that something you really thought about before going there or was it uh, a brilliant idea of a producer? So this is no this. So this particular sequence she's talking about was a. Um, we sent. I sent the, the camera crew ahead to film. You know, a New Hampshire scene. New Hampshire is a big hunting state, and it was a rabbit hunt, and there was this and Di, who is a brilliant cameraman, absolutely fantastic, uh, who I work with now, brilliant, brilliant because he hasn't. He's been in Washington for a long time, and he still finds something fresh to film there every day, and that's an achievement. So he. And, and he's incredibly hardworking. So he did this amazing sequence of a, basically a white rabbit running through the, the, the forest with dogs hunting after him. And I think in a moment of either sugar deprivation or something, I thought, that's the image. You know, this rabbit is just like the American vote in the primaries. White, scared, you know, upset. You know, or they're white, upset and white, which is all true. But it was so sort of, it was so cliched and ham-fisted. You know, sometimes... You know, cliches are always there. They're like, they're like ghosts. They're seducing you all the time. It's the easiest thing to do is to write a cliche. You want to write it before it becomes a cliche, or if you're going to use it, just smother it with love, you know. <laughs> and that's what we did there. And it kind of worked. It's just, it's just weird. Because and, and American politics in this stage is are, are difficult to cover. Because ultimately, in this country, let's face it, no one really cares whether Mitt Romney or Rick Santorum, and who are these people called Mitt Newton, Rick, and Ron, and John, and, you know, it's all a bit confusing. And what happened to our wonderful Barack Obama anyway? And why are we talking about these other people? But these people might one day run the free world, you know, so pay attention. OK, got some, a lot of people up the back here, I think. Let's, yeah. uh, Mr. Fry, if you look at the American coverage of the phone hacking scandal, you detect a genuine sense of shock at what has gone on in the British newspaper industry. And I was just wondering if you were shocked by the revelations and what you think sort of needs to happen in the future. Gosh, well, yeah, I was shocked by the revelations. I don't think anyone, um, anyone could not have been shocked by it, especially as they kept coming and coming and coming. Um, and I think we're going to hear more of this. And it's not just about the phone hacking. It's about the police collusion. It's about, you know, it's about the extraordinary power of the Murdochs in the political landscape here. And... It's interesting, in America this was covered to some extent, but not nearly to the same extent as it would be in this country, partly because the name Murdoch doesn't mean anything to most Americans, even though they, a lot of them watch his product. I mean, Fox News is by far the most popular television news channel and, and is, is an integral part of the <laughs> political machine, of the Republican machine. Sarah Palin is a commentator on Fox News. Karl Rove, Bush's brain, as he was called, is a commentator on Fox News. When Fox News decides that a candidate is not worthy of their attention, that's bad news. So the Murdoch empire, in some ways, actually has a more direct impact on the political landscape in the states than it does here. Uh, however, people don't know that it's you know, a guy called Rupert Murdoch is behind it. 
The New York Times loved the story for obvious reasons and wrote it up in 7,000 word articles day after day after day. Um, <laughs> and MSNBC, which is the kind of liberal counterpoint to Fox News, lapped it up as well. But ultimately, this was, a, you know, I mean, and if it were to ever kind of, I mean, there was a point, I think, when the Daily Mirror had said, oh, um, some of the 9-11 victims had been hacked. And of course, this is one tabloid against another tabloid and turned out to be bollocks, I think. But, but at the time, if that had been true, that would have been a huge scandal yeah. in America. However, because it stayed on the island, on this island, and America is so consumed with itself at the moment, it never had the kind of impact that you might have expected it to have. Okay, next. Yeah, in a way you didn't complete the story and what are your future plans? Do you know what they're going to be uh, as regards pres presenting, which I got the impression you weren't so keen on? No, I love presenting. I love presenting. I really love it. No, it's, um, no I'm, I like what I've, I'm very happy at the moment because I've got a bit of everything. I do some presenting, I do some reporting and I'm going to do some documentaries and, and you know, that's a nice combination. That gets you out of the building a little bit but then you can also, I'm getting older, so, so running around um, my father, who was a journalist, said to me, he said, you know, at some stage, the kind of thing you do just looks a bit unseemly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Hello. <coughs> Sorry, I've also kind of lost my voice. Um, when you're covering America, you're obviously talking to some extent to people with a, a sophisticated understanding of U.S. politics, mm. yeah, uh, um, as well as to people who know very little. Does that ever make it difficult to, to work out how to pitch something so that yeah. it's kind of interest to everybody? Makes it very difficult. And uh, that's the main, it's a question you ask yourself all the time. You know, is this relevant to someone at home? And am I going to offend the guy who runs the America desk in the foreign office? Or indeed some, you know, I mean, friends or colleagues watching it in the States. And I think you just have to be, you know, you have to try and be confident about it. I mean, you know, there's no point in playing inside baseball on Channel 4 or indeed BBC News because it just means very little to most people watching. But you can extract the relevance of a story and, again, find that telling detail um, and, and sort of make it work. It's like that film, The Player. Do you remember that, the Hollywood film? And, you know, Tim Robbins says, what's this film about? 30 seconds, come on. And the essence, every story has an essence to it. And the essence is sometimes changed by some of the detail. And you have to try and capture the detail that changes the essence of the story without flooding people with all the stuff they don't need to know. Okay, so this chap here. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I worked for several years in Bosnia after the Bosnian War, mm -hmm. and um, even now um, I, I still stop the car regularly to start taking notes of BBC radio <coughs> programmes, mm. and I've used them extensively. Some of Alan Little's stuff in recent years is something that would have been a real game changer mm. for many of our people because he said things in, as you've just said, in a few minutes that say so much about how we have to do our job. Um, my question, though, is um, more generic. Are there any particular themes or specific topics that you feel are the next big stories that perhaps, well, for whatever reason, the British mainstream radio and TV media is not covering or just hasn't covered yet? I don't know if there are. I mean, I think there's so much stuff at the moment that we seem to be covering, I mean, across the board pretty well. I mean, you know, the Eurozone crisis uh, obviously being one, you know, what might happen with Iran and Israel, which is being now increasingly being talked about. But again, when it hasn't happened yet, you've got to be slightly careful how much you talk it up. And, you know, Iran, Israel is one of those examples. You've just got to judge it carefully. But the Eurozone is interesting. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by it. As I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Euro trash through and through, and I feel very comfortable in lots of different European countries. And I think that's a really, really difficult story to cover because it, ultimately it's a, it's a financial story that has social and human implications. Um, and there's real drama there. I mean, Greeks you know, losing their jobs or Spaniard, young Spaniards out of work in colossal numbers or Germans holding on to their purse strings. You know, it's all, these are all great stories. They're invested um, in history. They're about sort of national paranoias and, 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 you know, and it's a fantastic story, which I wish I was covering more of, actually. Um, but it's important, and it's important to, to an audience here, even though we're not part of the Euro, you have to understand it in Britain for all, all the obvious reasons. But then, as Tony Blair once said, whenever you use the word Euro in front of everything, including sex, it becomes a complete turn-off. So. <laughs> Matt, um, what story in your professional life do you, that you didn't cover do you wish you had? 
and which one which you did cover do you wish you didn't? Oh, my God. Um, well, I, you know, I never went to Iraq during the war, uh, ever. I've never, never been there once. Um, and, I, and in some ways, I wish I'd covered that because, you know, talking about Iraq from Washington without having been there makes you a bit of a fraud, to be honest. And, you know, I know you're there to analyze the, the policy, but unless you see what the policy, what impact the policy is having on the ground, you can't really talk about it, to be honest, with any great authority. And I think that was a missive. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to go a few times. My wife said, you must be joking. There's no way you're going there. And anyway, it was a, it was a problem. I, I should have done it in a way. Um, uh, what story did I cover that I wished I hadn't covered? There was a CAP summit in Luxembourg <laughs> about soy, the soybean complex. That was one of my best, but I still wish I hadn't covered it. Yeah. Okay. I'm Matt. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're a big okay, sorry. Um, actually, your wife was right. So, yeah. <laughs> coming from a wife of a foreign correspondent, but um, I think a lot of people are asking these days um, what we see now and what's happening uh, in the Arab uprisings, um, the Arab Spring. Our footage shot with um, non-professional mm. cameras on phones and on with, I don't know, iPads maybe, <laughs> and being sent to all the major networks around the world and are being shown, I mean, end to end, you know, 24 hours, 24-7. Um, with the death of people like Anthony Shadid, mm. albeit, you know, it was an, a health issue that had to do with being go on no man's land on horseback, and um, Marie Colvin, Colvin yeah. and um, the nameless other, um, I think there are 11 correspondents yeah. that have been killed just since the beginning of this year, covering these um, hotspots. Um, what do you think is the future of television, um, you know, networks sending right. people in, you know, is the social media and, and uh, mm. all these, t you know, uh, electronics going to affect? I, well, I think it does inevitably, but I don't, think, I don't think that most serious organizations are thinking that social media will replace what they have in place. I mean, I don't think, it's just another source of information. So, you know, if you can't get into Syria, and we just haven't been able to get in very much, but you have this evidence on your mobile phone or on the iPad, they're gonna, you know, and it, and it looks, and you can, and it's sometimes difficult to judge it, whether it's kosher or not, but you're going to use it. That's, that's all there is, and you should use it, because in the absence of using that, you use nothing, and then, you know, then the baddies have won, because then the information's not coming out. Um, so you try and get the information where you can, and, and we had a film last week on Channel 4 that was shot by a stills photographer, a chap called Manny, who went into Homs and spent, I think, almost three weeks there, and it was extraordinary stuff. I really urge you to watch it, not just because it's Channel 4, but because here was a guy who... <coughs> He's a stills photographer. He's courageous. You know, he's committed. And he just points his camera at every frame is beautiful. And stuff happens within that frame that you just wouldn't believe. And it's not even so much people getting killed. It's just it's the humanity of it. Uh, there's an amazing shot of, you know, he interviews, and it's brilliantly done. He interviews this kid who um, has just lost his uncle. And the interview's done with him holding his uncle's photograph above his own face. You never see the kid's face. You just see the uncle's face. The kid becomes the uncle. It's a big picture of his, you know, of his face. And he talks about it in Arabic, and it's subtitled. It's just, it's extraordinary. It's very, very moving. And again, here's, you know, so, you know, this guy, he's not sent, I mean, I don't know how he came to see us or how we, I mean, I don't know what the commissioning process was. But it's not the most obvious thing to do. And, I mean, American, a lot of American networks like to be in control of these things and often don't use those sort of people. But it ran on NBC, they ran 12 minutes of it, yeah. which for NBC, as you know, is, is a big deal. Okay, question. Thank you. Hi Matt, um, my question's about working in the field. Can you tell me a little bit about how you work with producers in the field and what skills you look for in a good field producer? Well, there are two of them sitting in the audience right now, so I'm gonna be very, I've worked with in the past, <laughs> one especially who's a, a, a good friend, so I'm going to be very, very diplomatic what I say. Um, then it, it, producers are essential. Producers always get, they get, often they get cut out in terms of the awards process. You know, producers very rarely get onto the stage and, and get the gong. You know, it's the cameraman or it's the correspondent. But actually, producers are essential for, especially in moments of madness, for providing uh, much needed sanity. You know, and just you want to talk to someone else. How does this work? How does this story work? How is it going to fit together? You know. Been, I mean, I remember the first, first time I came across you when you were a producer for Martin Bell. 
you know, I remember doing some piece, I thought, this is, Martin had just been shot, so this was my big moment to do telly. And, and I wrote something which, of course, made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And Vin came and said, you can't say that. And that doesn't make sense, and just change it. And, if you, and, and once you take the bruising to the ego, <laughs> the product is better. You know. So it is, it's, it's, there are, it's essential. It's a team, look, it's, I'm sure you've heard this dozens of times, but it's true. So true. Television is a team effort. And that's where, getting back to your earlier question, you know, you're on your own, you've got your camera, you've got your laptop, you've got your satellite phone, you're playing the guitar while you're doing it all, you know, and reading War and Peace or maybe rewriting it. That's, you can do that, but it's not a great way to operate because it's much more fun and much better to do it with other people. Okay, two more questions, I'm afraid. I was going to run out of time. Yeah, this guy at the back here. Um, yes, you mentioned the incident in New Orleans when you intervened to prevent it from mm -hmm. kicking off between yeah. the uh, the rednecks and the, the unarmed African-American chap. Did you um, feel at the time that it was any sort of d conflict between being a neutral correspondent, an, an observer, and someone who intervenes in the story in the, in the course of events? Well, normally I'm not a great intervener. I'm a bit of a coward. I like to stand back and just you know, let, the, let the scene unfold. But just occasionally you just feel prevailed upon to do something. I mean, this is... A, this was just an absurd situation where, you know, you had to do something. And because there were no neutral parties in this, back to my earlier comment about the bloke from the, you know, UNHCR, it was astonishing. There were no neutral parties in this disaster. There were the victims and then there were the guys with guns. But there was no one from the city who'd come in who was not armed who could say, listen, let's just be sensible here. You know, this is about getting buses to people. This is not about you know, civil rights, it's not about racial conflict, it's a really boring logistical story gone horribly wrong. And so, and, and we were approached by a lot of African Americans because we were white people without guns, that, so we must therefore be officials of some sort. So people kept coming up to us over and over again saying, can you help us? And you say, well, I can't help you, but I can, I can get the message out, you know, I can talk to someone. I mean, that's not the kind of place you want America to be in. You spoke earlier about Martin Bell, who would uh, pace up and down, watch all the pictures, pace up and down, smoke a fag, and then spout all of these incredible words. What do you do? How do you write? I smoke incessantly, um, <laughs> and then I ring up Martin and say, what would you say? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you, I, I write on a computer. I like computer. I like to see the words on the page, and you can fid fiddle around and, you know, make things go away and then make them come back again. And actually, the whole editing process has uh, changed exponentially with a thing called Avid. You know, online editing is actually a very lazy way of editing because you can make your mind up and change it and then make it up again. Whereas in the old days, you had to really know what you were doing. But I like, I, I love it. I like, there's nothing, my, my I'm in, in like a pig and clover when I'm sitting in a nice hotel, you know, in an edit, you know, where the hotel rooms become the edit suite with a bit of room service, you know, and you've got these amazing pictures and you just sit down and it's that relationship between you and the editor. And that's a very important relationship. And it is like a sort of, it, it, it's really vital. I mean, it's vital that you, the cameraman shoots great pictures, but you've got to get on with the editor, you know, and the producer in the mix as well. It's all got to work. And when that doesn't work, because, you know, you've ordered the wrong room service or you're having a terrible row, it, all, it can fall apart very quickly indeed. But if you have the good pictures, you're interested in the story, and you're working with, you know, people that you like, you can't really go wrong. Okay, thanks, Matt. It's been really great listening to your... Um passion for storytelling and I think for breaking formula and one of the things you do so well is to break the formula of television news so I'd like to thank uh, David and Angelique from the BBC College of Journalism thanks to Millie and the team from the Frontline Club thank you for your questions but most of all thanks to Matt Fry thank you thanks for coming